to glorify you, magnify you, and honor you this morning for you're so worthy, you're so glorious, you're so mighty. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We love you and thank you so much again for this day, your many blessings again, the privilege and honor and opportunity that we have to be here in the house of the living God. Father, we truly love you and we truly come here to honor and esteem you this morning above all else. We know every individual in this place could say we have this, that, or the other going on in our lives. Different things even as we leave this place that we may need to give attention to. But this morning, Father, during this time, you're first. You're, pro or you're our focus in this service, Father. We push everything aside. Cast our cares upon you, for you care for us, and you love us, Father. And we seek ye first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. And then those other things will be worked out. They'll be added unto us. We know, as Paul said, our determined purpose this morning is but to know you and the power of your resurrection, Father. Many other things, again, may need and, and, and vie for our attention, but they cannot be primary. They cannot be first. And Father, right now we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we know these are things that we must do daily, every second, every minute, out of every hour of every day. But Father, right now in this service, Father, we are saying we're submitted and surrendered unto you and we come by faith expecting to receive something from you. And we don't take this time lightly, but seriously, Father. And we say now, Holy Spirit, you say what you want to say, do what you want to do, move as you see fit. For Father, you know the hurts, needs, and wants of everybody in this place, the words that need to be spoken, Father, for the ones that know they need help, maybe others that don't even realize they need help, Father, but we all need help, and we all need you, and we all need to learn to come to a greater dependency upon you this message even this morning, that I thank you, you're going to help me minister by the Spirit of God, not only with the Word, but illustrations and examples from life, my life, and of course, backed up with the Word of God, we thank you, Father, that you're going to reveal to us by the Spirit of God, that you want to reveal to us, and show yourself to us in a greater way but it must be less about us and more about you every single day as John said we must decrease and you must increase father we don't want a part of you we don't want a measure of you we're in hot pursuit of all of you father and that's in the sermons that make us want to hop skip and dance and it's in the messages so long as they come from the word and the spirit that make us want to examine ourselves examine our works examine our life so we thank you this morning we're not here to dictate the terms on by or what means of message is going to come forth we just say here we are we're ready to receive what the holy ghost has to say this morning and we thank you he's going to have free will, free reign, free flow. We thank you, Father, as all of us come together expecting to receive something from you, Father, by faith in Jesus' name. We thank you we're going to receive the meat of your word by the Spirit this morning. It's going to change and order the course of our lives forever, never to be the same again will be. And we thank you most importantly, all the said and done today will give you the glory, honor, and praise that you so deserve. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated at this time. And if you have your Bibles, go to Galatians chapter 2. I believe, yes. Galatians chapter 2 is where we're going to start. <coughs> Excuse me. Galatians chapter 2, we're going to read verse 20 for sure. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. As, as I mentioned in taking up the outreach offering, and if you've been here, I wouldn't say hit and miss on the messages. The messages are as the Lord leads. But if you've been here any amount of time uh, in, the, in the recent weeks, months, I guess you could say back up to December, you know that things have been different, been different in a good way, uh, been working on us. God's been working on us. As long as God's working on us, we ought to be fine, right? Because we know everything he does, whether it's encouragement, even though that's what's popular today, you know, encourage me, whether it's encouragement, whether it's reproof, rebuke, uh, no matter what it is, as long as it's God, everything he says and does is in our best interest because he has your best interest at heart. It is true, biblically true, that he's a good, loving, heavenly father. Amen? But a good father does not only say, this is good and that's good, keep doing it. If you're headed the wrong way in love, the good father speaks the truth. 
Amen? To help you to avoid destruction and catastrophe. So we've been examining ourselves in the Word of God, by the Spirit of God. And of course, God's been the one. He does His part, and we must do our part. But we've been in pursuit of His presence. And, and it's, it's, I believe even this past Thursday night, we got good on the definition there. We've been talking about three or four weeks on the foundation of repentance out of uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, I believe, is where we started at. Each week has been our text. And, and we noticed one thing about repentance by definition it, what, what is always running through there? Change. Change. And, and we have established, you can go back and get the messages, we're not going there this morning, that we are to be, be living a life that is never the same. Never. Amen? We are not only not to be the same today as we were last year. We're not to be the same as we were yesterday. We are to be continually transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can walk out and accomplish the perfect will of God. That is a daily process. Change is a daily process. Walking with God is a daily process. Amen. Studying and praying and seeking His face is not something that we even do just once a week on Sunday morning or when it's convenient. Amen. Amen. Because I'm not my God and neither is the world. He's my God and we're doing this thing His way. And thank God we've got the greatest support system we could ever ask for in God the Father. Jesus Christ the Son, who's our Lord and Savior, and here in the earth today with you and me and in this service is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost of God. Amen? He's our paraclete, as our helper. We've got all the help that we need to succeed. Amen? He's going to help us this morning. He's going to minister to your heart. He's going to help me deliver this message. But when you leave and go your way, and I leave and go my way, the Holy Spirit goes with us. Amen. Because greater is he than he greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. As I went, and, and I've mentioned this a few times, but as I went at the beginning of the year and endeavored to seek God and pray on behalf of the church, of course I have my daily prayers as well, like you do, I'm sure. But as I went to seek God for direction from the church, he immediately turned everything back on me to examine myself and to prove my own work and to test what I was doing. And one of the things that I've got wrote down in my study. He said, this is one thing I want you to do. He said, I want you to study. And I made a list of words that the Holy Spirit gave me. He said, I want you to study. We're going to talk about crucifying yourself this morning. So we might not be, you know, dancing and shouting. Or, but if you get the gist of it, you will. But, but he said, I want you to talk about crucified. I want you to talk about submission. I want you to talk about obedience. I want you to talk about denying yourself. I want you to talk about abstaining. I want you to talk about mortifying the deeds of the flesh. I want you to talk about all I want you to talk about suffering. Study, not talk about. I want you to study these things. He said, because my church and my people have decided which parts of my word that they like, and they've kept that, and these other parts that they don't want to hear anything about, they've chunked them and don't talk about them anymore. It's why if you see all this stuff, not just on TV but in the church, you see plenty of leadership conferences. You see plenty of increase and prosperity conferences. Amen? They're everywhere. You see all kinds of conferences. You don't see any holiness conferences. You don't see any submission to authority conferences. And there's a reason for that. Because they wouldn't need a very big auditorium. Our church would probably be too big. Even if the advertisement was across the state. Because it's not what people want. It's not what people are looking for. But we're not, it's not about what we want and what we're looking for because as we have established from the Word, and, and it's, I'm going to back it up this morning with the Word, but this has been the theme from since January, and all of you guys that's been here know this. We're not just starting this morning. If I have my life set up like I want it, I am my God. And I must understand that. I am my God. If I do what I want, when I want, how I want, I live for me, myself. Nobody's going to say anything to challenge me. Nobody's anybody that rubs me the wrong way, one way or the other, for whatever reason, whether in the flesh or spirit, whether in the line with the word or not, I'm not messing with them. I'm not I, don't, I like who I like because they do what I like. I don't like you if you don't do what I like. Right? We have to be careful about those things. There's a biblical authority and a biblical uh, correction in the church. We see that. That's another side of it. Uh, people say, when you correct somebody, well, you, you, don't, you don't love. No, we love God first. He said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Amen? 
If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. I do what I do, and you do what you do. Live by the word out of love, not out of works, not out of law, and not out of condemnation, and not out of fear of other people. If I live my life because I'm endeavoring to fear, or I fear other people, or I want to be a, a man pleaser, then who's my God? Everybody else. What I want to do is find out what's God telling me to do. And then that's what I want to do. But in an effort, as we're going to see from the Word of God, in an effort to make this life easier, we have decided which parts of the Word of God that we wanted, and we decide who we're going to listen to and who we're not going to listen to based on our feelings. And then we be very deceived because, you know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I, I, I got devotions, I got the Word, I got these friends that are Christians. Yeah, but if I chose all of them, based on just I want to hear what I want to hear, then the reality is that's why I'm deceived because I'm not receiving what I need. I'm receiving what I want. And I'm living my life my way. Now in Galatians 2.20, we'll go ahead and read it. It says this, I'm crucified with Christ. When you think of crucifixion, again, the Lord's dealt with me about this repeatedly. There is a balance in this message. But there's also a deception in it if you don't take the whole thing. Because we know a half-truth is, is worse than a whole false doctrine. Amen? Because people will look at the half-truth of a thing, and they'll say, well, that's, that's right, so we're just going to take it. No, the whole thing's got to be in line with the Word. He said, I'm crucified with Christ, and that's something that he did for me. You're 100% right. That is a truth. Amen? That's not wrong. I'm crucified with Christ. But when you think of crucifixion, what do you think of? Death. Of course you do. Jesus died on the cross. And I thank God that Jesus died on the cross for you and me. He paid a price that we couldn't pay and we're crucified with him if we've made Jesus Lord and Savior of our life and we have victory over sin, over Satan, through the cross, through the blood of Jesus. And we talk about that and we don't even preach it enough. We should preach it more, but you hear even less preaching about the cross we're supposed to take up. The things we're supposed to crucify. Amen? The same thing with the faith messages I've been steady harping on because the Lord showed me this. It wasn't another man. It's not a message I got from somebody else. The Holy Ghost told me about walking by faith and not by sight. He said, my people think that they can take faith to acquire and achieve whatever they want in this life. And he said, the entire purpose of faith is to accomplish my will and plan and not theirs. That's why you'll see people steady believe in God for things and then it just never happens. It just never comes to pass. Amen? And we say, well, the Bible says what things soever I desire. I desire, the Bible is, we, we understand, this is, this is not a coupon book. Amen? It's that, well, I just got this deal and that deal, and I'm going to pick the ones that I want. No, this is a book of life. This is an instruction manual for my life. Right? That's what it is. This teaches me and tells me how to live. Everything it tells me to do, I can do. Everything it tells me not to do, I can do, but I shouldn't do. And God's not telling me not to do it because he doesn't love me. He's telling me not to do it because he knows that it's going to bring damage and destruction in my life and it's going to take me away from him instead of towards him. Yes. Amen? When he says, touch not, taste not, look not, he says all those things, therefore I benefit, they're not to hurt us. Amen? Amen? Do you believe and know God has our best interests in heart? At heart, excuse me. So he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now this scripture, if you don't understand that they're talking about uh, both natural and spiritual things, and, and then you might not would, would get it, but you understand. He's saying, I'm crucified, but, but yet I live. Right? We understand that I am a spirit, have a soul, live in a body. Right? The moment that I get saved and make Jesus Lord and Savior of my life, my, my, my spirit man is made brand new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Right? And we thank God for that. That should be your confession the rest of your life. We're not belittling anything that we have taught or that others have taught along these lines. You are more than a conqueror, but not by yourself. You're more than a conqueror through him. You say, well, I'm complete, not by yourself, and not because of your family and friends. You're complete in him. Amen. You don't overcome, oh, because you're the sharpest knife in the, in the, on the, in the drawer or in the block. No, we overcome, why? Because he overcame, and our faith is completely in him, right? 
Our faith and trust is in Him and Him alone, and we have got to come back to a greater dependency upon Him. We have got to, this life starts, no matter how messed up anybody's life was, this life, the life of God truly starts when we realize that this is not the life I want to live. This is not the person I want to be. And I come to the cross of Jesus Christ. And I submit and lay down my life. I'm crucified with Him. Right? And what does it say? I am crucified with Him. Nevertheless, I live. Because there's something that dies. I, my life, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. Right? The, the old man, we would say, is what we refer to. Right? But now I'm a new creature. I'm a new man in Christ Jesus. He said... I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. So, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So I used to live for myself, used to live for the world, used to live for Satan, sin, the devil, used to live that way, but I come to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That man is dead. I left him at the cross. He's nailed to the cross with his passions and his lusts. He's no longer but now I'm walking in a new life because at the cross, I picked up what Jesus died for me for. At the cross, now by faith, I really live. What does it say? Nevertheless, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I'm more alive than I've ever before, been before, but there's some things that's dead. I'm not living my life my way anymore. I'm not living my life unto myself. I'm not living my life to please people. I'm not living my life to be like everybody in the world. I'm living my life unto God. I'm living my life for My steps are ordered by him as he is. So are we in this world. Yeah. Amen? We cannot be crucified and living. We cannot divorce or separate these two. We cannot have or live the life that Jesus has made available to us while living our own life and securing our own interest in this world. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. So I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. 1 Peter chapter 2. We, we mentioned these, but I haven't been going to them. Verse 11. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. The whole chapter is good. talks about who you are now. <clears throat> Us being a, a holy priesthood and such. And, but down in verse 11, we need to understand, no matter who it offends, no matter who it upsets, no matter who gets mad, you need to know who you are. And you need to know whose you are. You need to know who you belong to, and you need to know who you're living for. You're not supposed to be like everybody else, and you'll get burnt every time you try to live like somebody else. We're like him. We're making sharp cuts. I'm no longer the man I used to be, right? You're no longer the woman that you used to be. You will say, well, so-and-so don't like it. Well, as we'll see it in the, in the Word, we love everybody, but we're not living based on what so-and-so likes. And we're not living based on what's popular today. Amen? As it's, it's, we've been mentioning and preaching, you can't see the difference anymore between the world and the church, and you even go to addressing sin in the church in line with the Bible, and the Christians get mad because the world's so full of the flesh, carnality. It ought not to be so. The, the things the Bible says shouldn't be named once among us. It's commonplace, and we embrace it. Amen? Amen. Yes, we need the Word of God. We need to do it God's way, and this is what we're going to do every single service. We're going to feed on God's Word. And the parts we're going to feed on is the parts He leads us to. Amen? Amen? If you want to stay the same, then it probably wouldn't benefit you to come. If you want to be like the world, it probably wouldn't benefit you to come. If you just want to ease or soothe your conscience on Sunday morning, it probably wouldn't benefit you to be a part of Resurrection Life Church because it's not what we're here for. True change in the heart of the believer making you more like him every single service church. But every day is his goal. Amen? That's what we want to be. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dearly beloved, talking to the church, talking to Christians, I beseech you as what? Strangers and pilgrims. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Now this is another one of them several letter, four letter words. Abstain from. When you abstain from something, what do you do? That means you don't do it. You know, they don't talk about abstinence anymore. They don't talk about it in the church. And there's only one reason they don't talk about it, because hardly nobody's ever done it. 
but it's still the Bible. You can't compromise your standard because you compromised your standard. The standard is the same in line with the Word. You say, well, I messed up and I messed up here and there and God was merciful and He forgave me. He did forgive you, but He didn't change His standard. And it still should be what we teach or preach. And whether I miss it and fall tomorrow, whether you miss it and fall tomorrow, the standard is still the same. It's the Word of God. It does, it's not based upon whether I make it or not, whether you make it or not, or whether we all make it or not. It's based on whether Jesus made it or not. And He did. Because we talk about the cross and where He died, but they went back three days later and He wasn't there. Because he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's alive. And you and I are too if we're crucified with and unto him. Amen. And he said, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. That whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works. People are to see God in our life daily. Now the church has bought a mentality that the more I'm like them, I've got to be like them to help them. You've got to be like Jesus to help them. They don't need nobody like them to help them. That's ignorant. I have people to tell me about the past. You say, well, so-and-so can help them because they've been down that path. And so-and-so can help them because they've been down this path or the other path. There may be a balance in saying that, that they might know some things that me or somebody else didn't know, but by that standard, Jesus can't help them. He didn't sin. So he can't help them. If they had to do it in order to help them overcome, Jesus couldn't help them. Because he was tempted to sin and never did. You don't need to know the problem to help somebody. You need to know the solution and the answer. His name is Jesus. Amen. Amen? He said, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they, they may by your good works, which shall be they shall behold, they can see, glorify God in the day of visitation. But the NLT of verse 11 says we are, he said, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your soul. Temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your soul. And then the verse 12 of the NLT says this, it says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior. And they will give honor to God when He judges the world. They will see, they see something different about me and you. I don't talk like them. I don't walk like them. I don't do business like they do. I don't have the relationships that they do. Why? Because they are not my first priority. My allegiance and my honor is to God. He's the government, government of all of my relationships. He's the governing body at my house, in my church. Amen? You know, we've had, you, in different times, say, well, we sing music this way or that way, and sometimes you say, well, I think Lord Lee's told me before, so it's, it's some, sometimes we say, well, it's like a funeral, or it's like a this or that or the other. We need some funerals at churches, and we don't believe that no more. We need some funerals at the house of God. We need some self to die. I said it uh, two, well, Thursday night about Charles Finney. What did he say? He said, Mr. Self is the greatest man, is the greatest problem that I've ever had, is dealing with Mr. Self. I just wrote these down. I forgot to say them this morning. In a world where everything revolves around yourself, protect yourself, promote yourself, comfort yourself, and take care of yourself, Jesus says, crucify yourself. And we'll show you that in just a minute. Andrew Murray says this, God has a plan for his church upon earth. But alas, we too often make our plan and we think that we know what ought to be done. We ask God first to bless our feeble efforts instead of absolutely refusing to God unless, and refusing to go unless God goes before us. We have within us a self that has its poison from Satan, from hell, 
and yet we cherish and nourish it. Talking about self, not talking about your spirit. What do we not do to please self and nourish self? And we make the devil within us strong. Look at your own life. What are the three works of hell? They are chiefly these three. Self-will, self-trust, and self-exaltation. Self-will, self-trust, and self-exaltation. Amen? How can I tell how full of myself I am? Well, how quick does it take you to get offended? Because it's not your spirit, man, that's offended. It's your flesh. So how do I know if I promote myself? How much do you talk about yourself? And you want everybody to know what you ate and posting it everywhere. You want everybody to know about you? You died at the cross. Your life is now to consist of making everybody know about him. It's not about you. And it's not about me. It's about him. Now we've been saying I want to move a God. We can't pick and choose. We can't cherry pick the word of God and then have a move of God. It's not going to be possible. We may think this part is not necessary, but it is. Even if it's a whittling down of the church to the eight but 20 or 30 of us, we're going to love everybody just the same, but we're going to love nobody as much as we love God. Because it's what's necessary to move forward. You say, well, this is what the other churches are doing. That's what's wrong with us. We know what everybody else is doing. And even if they're right, we may know what God wants everybody else to do. But what's God want you to do? And what's God want us to do? We're here for a purpose. You're here for a purpose. You're not here to fit in with everybody else. You are here to help those that God wants and wills you to help. People to see the light of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life and in yours. From the least to the greatest in the church, I'm going to be more involved and not less in different areas. I want to know how are we handling this. From the, the toddler, the nursery, the toddler, the Sunday school, the children's church, the youth, all the way down the line. The, I don't care about programs. I want to know how much of this is involved and is it rightly divided. This is priority. Amen. This is number one. It, it will be here. I can't control everybody's life, but it will be here. Amen? This, it has to be God's way. We want God's blessing, but not do it God's way, and it's not possible. Amen? It's an absolute impossibility. It will never happen. It will never work. But it will when we do it His way, because the signs follow the Word, right? Miracle signs and wonders. Go to Hebrews chapter 11, along the same lines of what we are talking about, being pilgrims, strangers, temporary residents. We have to be careful. We are not here as permanent residents. And the message that you believe, the message that you live, you know, you say, well, this is good, and this is what I believe, and this is what I like, and this is who I'm listening to. Well, that's good. It's fine. It, but you don't just need a message that you can live with. You need one you can die with. Amen? Amen? You don't just need one you can live with. You need one you can die with. You don't need one just going to make you feel good upon the face of the earth. While you're here, you're not staying here. Amen? You're closer to the end. I, 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 do you believe in long life, Pastor? Yes. Do you believe in health? Yes. We're not changing any of those things. But to be honest with you, a big hindrance to us walking in the blessings of God is we're endeavoring to live our life and receive His blessings by faith. And the whole act of faith is a fact of total dependency upon Him, not upon self. God never promised that He would bless everything I do at my own will and my own desire in an effort to please myself. He blesses his plans. He must be the architect. Amen? Amen? It's why we see, you know, there was a big argument about marriage and homosexuality and lesbianism and same-sex marriages and all these kind of things. And I was asked, you know, what do you think? I don't, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I think. You say, what's your opinion? I don't have an opinion. I did not create the divine institution of marriage. God did. Therefore, I have no authority to change the definition of it. I don't have an argument. I have no dog in the fight. Anybody that is living that way has a demon spirit. And we'll get them set free. We have no problem with helping anybody. But I, I, I never did have to get into that argument at all because I didn't create marriage and I can't change marriage. And the people that have endeavored to, they think they're wiser than God. And they're going to find out the hard way it don't work like that. Because you reap what you sow. Amen? 
Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 says this. <clears throat> this is called the faith chapter. But verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they, <clears throat> for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared them a city. We should not fit in in this earth. Many Christians even praise others and think it's a good thing when you fit in anywhere you go. You ought to stick out like a square peg in a round hole. That's the way you should be. We should not fit in if we're full of the world, full of God, and, and the earth is full of the devil, full of the world. We shouldn't be able to do everything everybody else does comfortably. We have been consecrated, set apart, and set aside for his use. Many would say today, what's the message to the church? God wants us to be Christians. Christians mean something by definition. Some of the most basic things we've overlooked. Christians means Christ-like. And people say, well, God loves me anyways. Well, we took care of that on, Sunday, on Thursday night. He does love you anyways. But that doesn't mean he loves what you're doing. You can do things that are pleasing to him, the Bible says. You can do things that are not pleasing to him and grieve the Holy Spirit and hinder him from being able to operate in your life. The Bible talks about two different kinds of servants. The profitable servant and the unprofitable. And whether I'm profitable or unprofitable under the kingdom of God is up to me and not God because he's already done everything necessary to make me pro profitable. Amen? He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Right? Are we pursuing him? Are we seeking him? Thank God they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. We are to follow and imitate Christ. We are not to be anything like this world. Romans 12, 2. Some of these we have mentioned, but we hadn't necessarily went and looked at. Romans 12, let's read 1 and 2. Because we want to look at another word here as well. <clears throat> Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. It's, it's very often, you know, and I hear, I hear, I've heard, not recently, but I've heard them talking about peer pressure in the youth, and, and rightfully so, and, and among children. But the reality is peer pressure never stops. That doesn't stop when you get out of high school. You always got the pressures of what you know, even if they don't say it, people will let you know what they think you should do. And what you should do is what God tells you to do. And when you do it, everybody's not going to like it. Everybody's not going to approve of it. But we have had to decide inside already, do I want man's approval or God's approval? Amen? Do I want man's approval or God's approval? Yes, I want God's approval. I'm going to do it his way. No matter who they are, no matter how much I love them, no matter how much God loves them, whether they see it's right on this side or they don't see it's right to the other side, I'm going to love everybody, but I'm going to please God first. I owe him my allegiance. I owe him my everything. I would have no life without him. Right? Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now we say what? This is my body. I can do what I want to do with it. That's the same thing as saying I'm not a Christian. And I reject his word. This is not my body. It's not. It's my body in one sense, but this body he tells me to do what? It's my reasonable service to do what? To present my body. Now we got another four little word coming up. Present my body a living sacrifice unto God. This is my reasonable service. Now sacrifice is not popular either. It's another one of them. Several letter, four letter words. Sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God. In verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. You're going to be one or the other. Amen? This word conformed, I just jotted it down this morning is assuming a similar outward form, expression, but it also means this. To be conformed to something, it means following the same pattern, model, or mold. In other words, if I'm conformed to the world, I do the things the world does. 
What's popular to them and at their house is popular in my house. Whatever is popular today, whatever is popular tomorrow, I'm going to do it because it's the next big thing. We don't need the next big thing. We don't need anything new. We've already got the best. Nobody's going to come up with nothing better than what you've got. Nothing will beat the life of God, the peace of God, the joy unspeakable and full of glory that comes only from abiding in the vine of the Word and the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing's going to top it. Many of us have tried so many different avenues and so many different ways to find love, peace, joy, hope, happiness, only to find out that it's in nothing, but it's in someone. Many of us have took that path. And if we haven't learned, it's time that we learn that Jesus is the answer. He is the solution to every problem that we have. He is. Whatever problem you got at home, Jesus is the answer. You said, I just don't know what to do. The instruction book is right here. You know, I was mentioning the top. You said, I don't know where to start. You go to the bookstore and ask them afterwards. Let me get one of these topical Bibles. It's not a different Bible. It goes with the one you got. And it talks about the husband. It talks about the wife. It talks about the children. And it'll give you scriptures on what the Bible says about your family. And that's who you need speaking into your house. You need to know how God says to raise your children, not what all of these yahoos in the world are saying is popular. They're not improving on God's plan. This is not like a worldly thing where it's always getting better and better. It can get no better. It's already the best. You can't improve on the best. This is God's plan. This is God's way. And there's no regret that comes from doing it God's way. But there's much regret that comes from doing it any way other than God's. To be conformed to this world, and remember, we're going to be one or two things. We're not going to be both. We're either going to be conformed to this world, or we're going to be transformed by renewing our minds with the Word of God. Amen? I need to know that I do what I do because what I do is right and it's not right just because I said so. And it's not right just because my mom and daddy said so. Or my grandpa and grandparents, my grandparents said so. It's right because this is what God said. And this is why I do it. You need to know your God and you need to know what you believe. You need to be willing to pay the price. Whatever the price is, it's necessary. And this is, again, it's cursing in the church today to talk about sacrifice, to talk about paying the price. But anybody that tells you there's not a price to pay and a cost for living to God, for living for God is a liar. There is a cost. There's going to be people that don't like you. There's going to be people that's against you. And many times it's going to be Christians. You've got to love them and keep your allegiance to Him. Because nobody matters as much as God does. He's first. Amen? Always. There may be second, third, fourth. He's primary. He can't be on down the list. But we're going to be conformed or we're going to be transformed. We must decide which one are we going to be. Conformed or transformed? I'm going to be conformed by what? We're not going to go there. Colossians 3, 1 through 2 or 3 says to set your affections on things above. Heavenly things. Set your affections on the Word and what the Spirit's saying. How do I become like the world? It's my focus. It's where my affection is. It's where my attention is. I'm doing everything that they do. But how do I be transformed? By the renewing of your mind. With what? You could ask today, what is the difference between the church and the world? And the emphatic answer for most people that tell the truth, what is the difference? It would be not much. Not much. There are things that even this day, that this is shocking to me. Because I don't go against other churches. I'll be real careful. You know what I say. But I think the Super Bowl's today. And I can assure you how much I care this morning. It means nothing to me. And I, you say, well, you don't like sports. Or you, you, you don't know what you're talking about. I like sports and I like football. They're not my God. They're not an idol me. Idol to me. And today is not football Sunday or football church to us. We're here for Jesus, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. That is nothing. That means no more to me than, honestly, as Paul said, dung. It's of zero importance compared to the Word of God and knowing Him. It means nothing. Oh, if we knew God as much as we know our favorite sports people, as we, much as we know our favorite politician. Amen? He said in Matthew 16, Jesus did verse 26, He said, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? You can gain all sorts of things in this earth, walk in this earth life, that only bring loss. It doesn't bring gain. Only brings hurt and heartache. And many would say, people need to hear hope. 
People need to hear a bright future. People need to hear encouragement when they come to church. What we have done and why we have not helped people is we've left this part off and we've just said, bring your life and put Jesus on top like a cherry and then you can leave here and you'll be happy. And they leave here and find out it's not true. It's a lie. Because that's not salvation. Salvation is you come to the end of yourself. Salvation is you get to a place that you realize this is not life. This is not living. Even though I may not know how to live myself, I know that this cannot be it. You have to come to the end of your rope before you can reach out and grab Jesus by faith. You don't take your old life with you. He said, follow me and I'll make you. You can't clean yourself up either. That's true. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But you got to, it goes hand in hand. you got to forsake all and follow him. This message, this life is not a part in proclamation. This is an all in. You're either in or out. We are either living for God or not. Amen? 1 Corinthians 9.27. We could read all of that. We're not going to. 1 Corinthians 9.27, the Apostle Paul talking. <clears throat> he said, talking about running this race, and he's talking to the Corinthians, talking to us as well. He said in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he said, I keep under my body, bring it into subjection. I make it do what I want it to do. I being who? He said, I keep under my body. I am a spirit, I have a soul, and I live in a body. This body of flesh wants to act the fool all the time. Say things it's not supposed to say, do things it's not supposed to do, react in ways it's not supposed to react. you got to renew your mind with the Word of God so that you know right and wrong. Your mind will side in with your spirit, and every time it wants to act up, you tell it to sit down and shut up. Amen. That's a true Christian. That's somebody that's walking with God. You said, I just say what I think. That's the equivalent of saying that I'm ignorant. I have no good sense. You say, I just say what I think. Well, we've got really two problems because you're not just saying what you think. You're kind of low on the thinking end too because we're supposed to be renewing our mind with the Word of God. There's a lot of times that you got some comebacks. You know, I always got a comeback. I always, I'm a quick thinker. But you also got to know you're not supposed to say everything you think because your mouth will overload everything else you got. And once you say something, you can ask for forgiveness. God will forgive you, and other people will forgive you. And it's a fact. It's biblically, and it should be so, especially in the church. But you can't take the words back. You said it. You said it. So it's better to get our minds renewed with the word. And, and, but the Bible says no man can tame the tongue. No man can. But God, the word, and the Holy Ghost can help you tame it. You can tame the tongue. You don't have to just, well, you can say what you think. As long as the only thing you think on is the word of God, then you'll be all right. You speak the word only is what Jesus told the centurion, or he told him in Matthew chapter 8, right? So he said, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I keep under my body, I, who's the real man, the spirit man. What, what dominated? What led Paul? He was led by the spirit. You and I are to be led by the spirit, right? I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest I, by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The way that I live this life, it matters. It does matter. I should be changing every day. And I know this goes against what a lot of people believe. And you say, well, I want to go to church and hear the music that I want to hear. I want to go to church with the group of people that I like the most. I want to go to tr the church where I like the way the, the preacher dresses or, or whatever. I want to go to church where I, I like the, the message is always encouraging. See, that's great deception. Because then you'll actually be in church and you're your God. Because you got everything just like you want it. You go to church where God tells you to go. You don't go where you like their programs, processes, and procedures. Where does God want you? He said, I give you pastors according to my heart, not your heart. He makes that decision for you. He makes that decision. Amen? Where do I need to be? Who needs to be my pastor? God knows that. God knows what you need, but when you choose, if your mind's not renewed, when you choose your pastor in church, you'll choose the one that's wrong every time. Because you'll choose the one that pleases the wrong parts of you. 
You don't need to be this morning all over on Super Bowl Sunday. Isn't the Super Bowl today? Yeah, on Super Bowl Sunday. That's what it's about. You know how much place that sports has in the church? Absolutely zero. None. And you could say, well, you're just somebody that's blasting sports. No, you're wrong. Because see what you don't know is I grew up playing sports. I know all kind of things and statistics and everything. But the closer I've got to God, you know, he's growing up. Pastor Jeremy's sitting in here. Pastor James. <laughs> had to mess with him. Brother James. He's my brother. They're both my brothers. But, but we, we was growing up. We played sport. Me and Jeremy played baseball seven days a week. If we weren't playing on the field, on the team, we played in the backyard. We played, we, we're switch hitters. Both of us are switch hitters. A lot of people don't know that. Great switch hitters. So why did you switch hitters? We had no choice. Our yard was so little, we had to swing from the left-hand side. So, so if we, we hit a home run every time, we was right-handed. So we both switch hitters. We, had to, we played left-hand games. So we would hit and, and field and play and all that kind of stuff. And if you hit a, wrong, a home run left-handed at eight or nine years old, you're doing good, if you're right-handed especially. But we played when it's football season, we played sports every day. But I thank God my parents, he, they did not allow us to put sports first. They did not. Sports were not allowed to be first. You say, well, they learned this, they learned that, they learned character there. You learn the character of God from abiding in the Word of God, not out yonder with the world. That's, uh, that is not biblical. And I don't think I said this on a Sunday morning. I've never been a condemnation or an attacking preacher, and I'm not starting today. But the Holy Ghost brought it up before church, and he brought it up again. I think I said this one time on a Sunday morning. I went by out here. What, what's the name of the sports place, the one, the ball field side of the high school out here? What's it called? Green Street. They got different ones out there. In and of itself, sports are not of the devil. I'm not telling you that. We're not that kind of church and people. But anything that takes the place of God, primary position is your idol. And it's a problem. I was riding by here on a Thursday night, and there's probably 5,000 cars. That's what it looked like. I'm just joking. There's cars everywhere out here at the sports field. And I ride by, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me when I went by. It's only happened one time, but I never forgot it. And this is what he said. He said, look out there. And I just looked out there. He said, do you know what they're doing? And I mean, to me, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, they're playing ball. <laughs> yeah, but he's fixing to tell me something else. He said, what are they doing? And of course, everybody don't have church on Thursday night. I understand that. But if his primary is the, is, is the point the Holy Ghost was making. I'd never heard it said this way. This didn't come up from nobody else's quote or nobody else's example. None. But that's what the Holy Ghost told me. He said, what is Satan? And of course, he dropped the scripture down in my, air, in, in my heart about air. He said, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He said, now, what are they doing? He said, this is how Satan works in the church, to make things primary that should be way down the line. He said, these individuals are taking their children, Satan being the prince of the power of the air, and they're taking a ball. And it's either full of air or being tossed around in the air, and that is the focal point of their lives. And it's wrong and it's sin. And that came from the Holy Ghost riding by the ball fields. Now, I'm not the preacher that gets up and bashes all sorts of things on Sunday, Thursday. Anybody that knows me knows that. If I was at your house today, I'm able to say nothing unless the Holy Spirit tells me to. But that's what he said. And I say that to help you because he told me to say it this morning. It is not priority. It is not most important. It is not how your child lives and learns to be an example. They learn that from you and God. See, we played ball seven days a week. But when it come time to be at church, uh, there was no ball at, at our house. That's the way we were taught. And I said seven days a week, every day. James didn't play baseball with us but just a couple years, but he played basketball. Daddy would play when he could get out there with us, but we had neighborhood kids. We played all the time as well. But what has happened is a lot of things that in balance may be okay. They have been escalated to be priority, not only because they're moneymakers, but they've been escalated to be priority. Yeah. If God's not first, it's a problem. Yeah. You know, there's people that will flat fight you over Clemson and Carolina. I wouldn't fight you over neither one of them. I choose to pull for the Tigers, and I can make all kind of jokes, but there's a quote that they've got that they're all in. If everybody's all in, I'm not. And I don't just say that to prove a point this morning. I'm not all in as a Tiger, a Gamecock, or nothing. I'm all in because I'm a Christ follower first. This is primary. And there'll be people who say, well, well that's boring. That's because you're not doing it. If you truly walked in, the, people do not understand. We talked about this some thirds. You need to get the CD. Keep referencing this. You said, I, I can't give up all these things. If I give up all these things, I have a boring life. You never give up anything for God and lose anything. When you give, it doesn't make natural sense. But again, that's why we're living this way. We're living on a natural plane. 
natural thinking. It doesn't make natural sense to give up anything and gain. Brother Bill's talking about this morning about tithing. God's all in on you. Are you all in on Him? This is the terms of the covenant, and our messages have been, even many of mine, and I hope I had not missed it, and I repent. If I have, ask God to forgive me every single day. But many of our messages, they're only on God's responsibility, right. on God's promises, only on what God has done for us. None on my obligation, none on what I'm responsible for, none on how I'm to live, none of those things. I don't want to talk about them. God is good. He is. Are you? God is faithful. He is. Are you? Oh, we can trust God. He is. Can He trust you? Oh, God is love. God loves me. He does. Do you love Him? All of those things are true. Amen? Oh, thank God for His Word. I thought y'all be dancing by now. But He said, I'm, I've been crucified with Him in Galatians 2 verse 20. I've been crucified with Him. And by the death of the cross, I'm just reading you this part. By the death of the cross, I have become utterly estranged this is crucified in the Thayer's uh, dictionary. I have been become utterly estranged from, dead to, my former habits, habit of feeling and action. I don't go by feeling, and I do not live the way that I used to live. Go to Romans chapter 6. I'm not going to get as far as I want to this morning, but I want you to just, if there's only a couple of scriptures, they stick in your head. This has been in mine every day. Or in your heart. But it says in Romans chapter 6, we'll start down in verse 6. See, we've been crucified with him, and we thank God he was crucified for us. That's a biblical truth. But there are things we must die to continually and daily if we're going to walk with him. Amen. Amen. Remember, I got the sword of the Spirit, Hebrews 4.12. I know. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. One side's a deal with the devil, but the other side's a deal with me. To deal with the flesh. Amen? Amen. Romans 6, verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7 was actually my personal text for the year. In the beginning by the Holy Spirit, He that is dead is freed from sin. He that is dead, my identity is in Christ. Not only is my identity in Christ, my dependency is upon Christ. The life that I now live because I'm crucified with them, it is not my own life. It's why some of y'all get caught up in the past. Everybody's tempted to do it. Get caught up in the past and can't let all these things go. It's because that's what we mind. That's what we think about. That's what we listen to. Everybody else says, that man is supposed to be dead. And every time you take that thought, you're the one resurrecting him. You keep resurrecting them. And then we can't figure out why they're alive. Because we're giving them mouth to mouth. We're bringing them every time we put them down. You know, every, you leave here today, you might say, oh, that's what I'm going to do. And somebody might cut you off uptown. The nature of the flesh is this. And I could take it to numerous places. You know, you come up from here, the red light, and I say, Papa and Granny's house that way. And you, you take a left, and you can take it, bear off to the right to go into Marion you got people that's in the left-hand lane and you're in the right-hand lane. This is the nature of the flesh. It's what I do every time. And you, if you're over there in the left-hand lane, you got to, you know, I, this is what I do to train myself. I really do. And, and Lordy knows it's my nature. I don't want to because I want to gas it and smoke them because they don't want to let you over sometimes. When you get your mind renewed with the Word of God, what you do for the safety of your family and for your sanity to have a sound mind and bring this flesh into subjection, you'll slow down and get behind them. You know what the nature of the flesh does? This part's for Wesley, if none of the rest of it is. <laughs> he knows I'm joking. <laughs> Wesley might jump. <laughs> he, he might, you might see Wesley going over the top of him. You never know. <laughs> but still, he knows I'm joking. I'm not joking. Lord, forgive me. I love him. But, but he's side by side. Jay's in the same boat. They side by side, and they got all these mufflers, and you over here, you're just cruising along, and they want to get up. What are they going to do every time? They're going to cut you off. They're going to cut you off. The nature of the flesh does whatever it can to get ahead. But the nature of the, human, the, the new recreated human spirit, the mind renewed with the Word of God, realizes I don't have to do anything to get ahead. I'm already ahead. I'm already the head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. Lender not a bar. I've already got everything I need to succeed. I'm content already. I don't have to beat anybody. I don't have to get ahead of anybody. People say things to you. Sometimes it may be perception. Sometimes people may legitimately say things to you to hurt you and offend you. You don't have to respond in kind. You don't have to say anything about it. 
There's been different situations. I've missed it and had, had to ask God to forgive me. There's different situations people will say things, and I got a good response. And, and most people know I could smoke them. I really could. That's the flesh. I wish I was slower. I got something to say. Yeah, I might just get a little smirk, though, because I'm going to be most of the time, sometimes not. I'm not perfect. But you have to, you have to realize you, you got that battle, that battle going on there in Galatians chapter 5. You got that, that pulling, that war going on inside. What's that war? What you going to listen to? You listen to your spirit? You're going to yield to the flesh. And it's going to have everything to do with whether you knew your mind with the Word of God or not. People say all kinds of things. So well, I wouldn't have done this if they hadn't have done that. That's like saying they're following the devil. Let's do it together. <laughs> Amen? I don't base what I do on what people say to me. I am not who other people say I am, and you're not either. Amen. So they don't like me, and they, but it's all right. They crucified Jesus, so you're like company. He said in 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 and 2, I'm talking about his suffering, and he, you're to arm yourself likewise. There's some things he suffered in the flesh, and there's some things as we follow him, everybody's not going to like us either. If we want to win a popularity contest in this world, and even among Christians, we're not going to be able to please God. He's got to be the one that has our allegiance, right? For he that is dead, verse 7 says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also should live with him. You see this death life proclamation. There's some things that's got to die if we're going to enjoy the life of God. It's a fact of life. A fact of the word of God. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon or consider you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. This is what I do. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. This is what I do. Verse 13, Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto God. For sin, verse 14, shall not have rule, master, have dominion, over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Do you see that? I want you to go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. I'm going to just read these to you, and I want you to meditate on them and think on them as you leave this place today. I'm going to read you 1 and 5 and, and 1 and 6, and then I'm going to let you go this morning. And, and we're going to come back and do all of 5, whether it's next Sunday or whenever it is, because i got something that, that's good. We, we, we think we have a lot of problems, but the reality is, is, is what we think is the problem is not the problem. But we're going to get straight to the problem. We're going to renew our minds. We're going to deal with this flesh. We're not going to be like everybody else. We're going to be like Jesus. Amen? They that are Christ, Galatians 5, 24. Sorry. Verse 24, they that are Christ. Are you Christ? We say, I, I'm crucified with Christ. That's true. Thank God that he's been crucified for us. We identify with him. We died with him. We arose from the dead with him. Victory secured through him, right? We're not changing that message. It's biblical. But it says this in verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. This tells us more than one thing. The flesh with what? Crucified the flesh. The flesh, your flesh, even as a Christian, it's got its own affections. It's got its own lust, which are desires. If you do what you like all the time, you be in trouble all the time. Amen. Amen? Now, if we get the word we're liking, obviously talking about our spirit and pleasing God, then you're good. But we're talking about here, he said in verse 24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. That's what who does? If the Bible's true, that's what I do. And then we go over here to verse uh, 14 in verse 6, we see there in Galatians 5 that we're to crucify the flesh with the affections and lust. And we're looking at verse uh, chapter 6, verse 14. We see we're to be also dead or crucified to the world. Was it 1 John 2, 13 through 15 or so there, or 15 through 17? I'd have to go look at it. It talks about love, not the world, neither the things in the world. <laughs> says in Galatians 6, verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory, save or accept in the, Christ, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. The world is crucified. The crucifixion, what, what does that symbolize? It symbolizes sacrifice. It symbolizes if you are crucified, you are dead. That's one definition for the word crucified, is dead unto he said, well, I've got to live out in the world. We never told you not to. You can go read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. When you get home, it's not that long. And it'll help you. 
He talks about living in this world. He talks about who to avoid, who to fellowship with. He said, I'm talking about Christians. You live, yeah, you live in this world, but you don't look anything like the world. You don't act anything like the world. You don't follow the customs of the world. It should actually be a warning sign to the Christian when everybody is doing something, but instead the church jumps on board 100 miles an hour. When everybody's doing it, that's probably the best reason for you not to do it. What does God say? Have we determined and decided we can live life without Him? By whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. I am dead to the world, and the world is dead unto me. What does that mean to me? Does that mean I hate people and I'm not for people? No, I love God so much. And the greatest thing you can do for other people, even that are in darkness in this world, is to live for God. People in this world do not need help from anybody that is like them. They do not need help. People say, why is there always room in the churches and nobody's going to church? Because the church thinks it can change people by being like the world. And the world says, my God, I can stay home and relax and do everything I want to all day on Sunday, Thursday or whenever they have church, and I'm better off than they are in my life in almost every area because we bought a lie that we're, we're not supposed to be different. We're not, to be holy is to be set apart, set aside. When he saved you, he set you apart. You got a new nature. You got a new father. Amen? You got a new family. We don't live in the past because it's dead. Stand to your feet.